Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the breakout session, Measuring Blood Pressure Accurately. If this is not the breakout session you're looking for, please message the panelists so we can help you get to the right place. While we wait for people to switch into the break rooms, we want to hear from you. Let us know in the chat box what organization you're with and where you're from. We're expecting people across New York State today. Please make sure you select all panelists and attendees so we can all see your message. You can also use the chat box to ask questions throughout today's session, and we will get to those during the Q&A portion. Now, please welcome Linda Murakami and Lakin Barkowski from the American Medical Association. Good morning, everybody. My name is Linda Murakami. Uh, I'm a reg registered nurse at the American Medical Association, and I work as a senior program manager there. Uh, we're going to talk to you this morning about measuring blood pressure accurately. And next slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Leakin and I don't have any disclosures this morning. Uh, next slide. And here are our, our, objects of, our objectives for today. So we're going to uh, list factors, patient, observer, and system factors that can make blood pressure readings inaccurate and identify strategies to overcome these factors. Use measure accurately and patient measured blood pressure tools to identify opportunities for improving accuracy and reliability of blood pressure measurement. We're gonna discuss use of self-measured blood pressure, which we'll refer to as SMBP, uh, monitoring for clinical management of hypertension, and demonstrate measurement techniques for in-office and SM, SM, SMBP. Next slide, please. Okay, so, <clears throat> We talk about measuring blood pressure accurately and why it's so important. Um, what we're up against is blood pressure varies in everyone every day at every minute. So your blood pressure is going up and down throughout the day when you're talking, when you're walking, when you're sleeping. Um, and what we know is the snapshot of this, you know, blood pressure poorly correlates with a patient's true blood pressure out, you know, in this 24 hour period. So in addition, we also know um, through research and observation that many office-based blood pressures are taken with poor technique, which can also lead to further inaccuracy. So then we're faced with you know, white coat hypertension when blood pressure is higher in the office than outside the clinical setting, mass hypertension when blood pressure is within normal limits or elevated, but you know, outside, um, outside the clinical setting, it's higher. Um, so we need these blood pressures to be accurate because of the reason we're using them. We're trying to diagnose people with these uh, readings for, you know, diagnose them with hypertension. We're trying to maintain and manage, you know, control of blood pressure. Um, so if we're getting poor readings, we could under or over diagnose patients and risk under and over treating our patients. And, you know, we know what happens when we over treat our patients, especially the elderly, uh, leads to dyspnea and falls and, and, you know, additional hospitalization. So uh, really accurate and reliable measurement is essential for diagnosis and management of high blood pressure. And that's why it's at the bottom in a nice bold print. Next slide, please. So here's a few of the guidelines that we use to uh, create some of our tools and resources and, and the information that we're talking about here and that we encourage you to use to reference as you learn more about uh, blood pressure and our guidelines. So there's uh, the 2017 guidelines. Uh, there's a measurement uh, scientific statement from uh, the American Heart Association. And there's an SMBP joint policy statement uh, with the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association. Next slide, please. So we have a polling question for you. How do you primarily take blood pressure in your organization? And just pick one for yourself, using auscultation, using you know, manual blood pressures, um, automated devices where with a push of a button, or maybe you have both of those in your clinical setting, or you know, if you're not sure, um, select that answer. Great. Well, say, so we see uh, the majority of you are using automated devices. That's fantastic. Uh, auscultation uh, comes with a few extra uh, hurdles that we uh, encounter when we're having to listen to those manual uh, readings. And people who have both, that's great um, when you have options. Next slide, please. Thanks for participating in that one. Okay. So. We're gonna talk about the different ways that we can measure uh, blood pressure. First one is manual office blood pressures. So um, 
practices, like you can see, still continue to use this method, but this manual method can be inconsistent and inaccurate because results are so subject you know, to observer issues. Um, there's issues with not inflating the cuff high enough or deflating the cuff too quickly or not properly hearing the Karakoff sounds. Uh, these sounds can be hard to hear if it's noisy nearby or those times when a patient you know, has a faint pulse. And there's also terminal digit preference issues that can play a factor here where you know, when we're listening and, and we're uh, writing down the blood pressure, sometimes people subconsciously uh, may um, you know, um, you know, uh, round the numbers up or down uh, to zeros or fives. So, and then we always wanna make sure that people are properly trained to perform the competencies for measuring uh, blood pressure accurately. Um, and, you know, to try and overcome all these observer issues. And we know that more time needs to be, you know, focused with manual blood pressure. So it takes a little extra technical training to make sure we, we master that, that um, function. Next slide, please. So semi-automated devices, um, these devices, using the automated devices, those are the ones that are really recommended by the guidelines. So that 60% of you are using some type of automated devices is fantastic over the manual methods. Um, semi-automated devices, they take one measurement after you push the button, and then some of them come in an all-in-one where you could get a pulse ox and a thermometer um, with it as well. Uh, the automation makes the measurements not as likely to be affected by variations in technique or human bias and are better able to be reproduced than readings taken manually. So there's no longer the issue with not pumping up the cuff high enough or deflating it too quickly and not hearing those Karakoff sounds. So these devices are considered reliable and accurate. We know people um, don't often, often trust them, but they are uh, per the guidelines and when you follow them. And uh, you know, select devices that are validated and calibrated regularly, regularly and we're gonna be talking about uh, device validation coming up. Next slide, please. So automated devices are also referred to as AOBP. And these are the ones that are fully automated they have the capability to record multiple blood pressure readings with a single activation. Uh, most of the time they're programmed to take three readings one minute apart, and the device can give an average of those readings, and you want to make sure that you include documenting the average uh, in the EHR. So because of programming ability, readings can be taken unattended. That means the staff can leave the room after starting the readings and allowing the patient to be alone, and this can help reduce white coat effect. Next slide, please. And then ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, also referred to as ABPM. Um, this is where uh, the blood pressure is recorded out of office and the device is placed on the patient and they wear it for a 24 hour period. And it's gonna measure their blood pressure intermittently throughout the day and night uh, while the patient's performing their normal activities and while they're asleep. So the advantage of the ABPM is the ability to identify blood pressure patterns, identify white coat hypertension or mass hypertension or nocturnal hypertension. And this is important because high sleep uh, blood pressures and the non-dipping BP at night can correlate with increased risk of morbidity and mortality. And these are just uh, some issues with the availability of ABPM. Uh, most primary care offices don't have one, so likely you have to get a referral uh, out to a cardiologist um, to, to use this uh, device. Next slide, please. So SMBP, self-measured blood pressure, is when a patient takes their own blood pressure at home. Um, so we um, prefer this method of out-of-office uh, blood pressure just because it's easier to do, it's more tolerated and more widely available. Uh, it's recommended by guidelines for confirming the diagnosis of hypertension and like ABPM, it can identify patients with white coat and mass hypertension. And several studies show that these measurements uh, maintain a stronger association with cardiovascular disease risk than the in-office blood pressure readings. And Lincoln's gonna be talking more about uh, SMBP coming up. Uh, next slide, please. So an important way to get accurate measurements is uh, making sure the staff is taking blood pressure readings properly and that they're trained to do so. So you wanna incorporate blood pressure training to include patient prep and positioning, appropriate cuff sizing, and make sure uh, to obtain and document your accurate results. So guidelines recommends training and retraining to occur every six months. Uh, we know that most organizations have at least done a minimum of annual competency program, or some people do an annual skills lab, and usually this includes blood pressure measurement. Um, so maybe if you can fit in an additional one 
uh, just a blood pressure check, recheck, uh, competency, uh, and, and additional time for that year to meet that six month requirement or recommendation. Uh, and for SMBP, we need to teach patients how to properly measure their blood pressure at home. So with that, you wanna make sure the staff know how to train patients on SMBP as well. Next slide. And we're gonna talk about now some action steps to measuring blood pressure accurately. Next slide, please. So provider need, providers need accurate blood pressure measurements to manage blood pressure in their patients. And we'll be reviewing each of these, but clinical teams can take these steps to improve the quality of BP measurements. Using BP devices that are validated and calibrated uh, will help with the accuracy of the device used and using correct measurement technique that include patient preparation and positioning, as well as taking the proper number of measurements can improve the quality of your BP readings. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, let's talk about the validation and calibration. Next slide, please. So the guidelines recommend using validated upper arm devices for obtaining accurate blood pressure measurements. So device validation means the device was tested for clinical accuracy by independent skilled blood pressure measurement experts using one of the internationally accepted testing protocols. So when selecting devices, you wanna make sure that they are validated. There's a US blood pressure validated device listing also referred to as a VDL um, at the web address validatebp.org. Uh, there are also some international VDLs available um, and that are listed on this slide, but the validatebp.org uh, website gets updated with additional devices as manufacturers submit their devices for review. Um, so Lakin, uh, she's going to pull up the website and uh, have a look at it. Thanks, Linda. So here you can see again, this is at validatebp.org. You can find the U.S blood pressure validated device listing. So if you're trying to see if your devices are validated, if you're looking to purchase new ones or you're recommending SMBP devices for your patients, this is a great website that you can use. What I will say is that all the devices on this list are validated, but not all validated devices are yet on this list. This is a growing resource. So continue to check back as the list is growing. So one nice thing that I wanted to point out to you all is that you are able to filter. So you can filter by brands and also device types. So you, if you're looking for 24-hour ambulatory monitors, you can look here. You have home devices, you have kiosks, you have office devices that take single readings and office devices that take multiple readings and average them. So you're able to filter to see what you need so that you can find that. All right, Linda, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Or, I'm sorry. Thanks, Lakin. Okay. And we can go to the next slide then, where we have another polling question for you. So how often are your blood pressure devices checked for accuracy in your clinics? Pick whatever answer you think is Appropriate, if you don't know, feel free to check on share. What do we have? Okay, so every six to 12 months. Um, so that's great, especially uh, if you have uh, wall-mounted manual devices, we're gonna talk about it. Uh, whenever it seems broken, um, we hope that we can uh, show you how we're gonna ask you to check those more often. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so calibration of devices. So we're gonna talk about each one of them. These devices, they also need to be calibrated as well as validated. So you wanna incorporate device calibration and recalibration into the maintenance schedule. All devices require calibration at different intervals. So you can see what we've listed here. These are guideline recommendations for calibration schedules. Uh, manual and aneroid devices are easily susceptible to error and loss of calibration, especially when handled harshly. So think about the times where you've, um, you know, carried it into the, the exam room, tossed it onto the desk, or if you're putting it away, someone opens the drawer, drops it in the drawer and, you know, shuts it, or you might be walking with it and just drop it onto the floor. Um, the normal schedule for manual devices is every two to four weeks, but Things like dropping it uh, would, require, would require the device to be calibrated even more often. 
Um, you can see that uh, it's needed less frequently for wall mounted, that's every six months. And the automated devices are calibrated the least frequently at every one to two years. And you wanna work with Biomed, uh, make sure they're using the proper pressure testing uh, devices and not just checking for leaks and uh, in the cracks and in the tubing in the in the cuff itself. Next slide, please. All right, now we'll talk about uh, correct measurement technique. Next slide, please. So 2017 guidelines recommends that when a new patient comes to the office, you wanna take a blood pressure in both arms. You wanna see which arm has the higher blood pressure. So you wanna use the arm with the higher blood pressure for all blood pressure measurements moving forward. And there can be a small difference between each arm. So treatment is based on the arm where the higher, with the higher blood pressure. And document which arm is um, the BP arm or what we refer to as the blood pressure BP arm in the EHR, if you can, so everyone knows to use it. Um, and make sure you tell your patients that uh, this is your blood pressure arm, you know, the right or left, so that they can tell others when they're taking the blood pressure, please use my right arm or left arm, whichever is the BP arm. And for patients returning for an appointment, you're gonna start and take one initial blood pressure measurement. And for all patients, be sure to properly position and follow the steps for measuring blood pressure accurately. And be sure to document the BP into the vital science field of the EHR. Oftentimes, uh, when a patient's blood pressure is high, we then recommend taking additional blood pressure readings. So let's go to the next slide, please. And what error, who is a polling question, what error do you see most commonly occur during blood pressure measurement? And what we're listing are errors, uh, putting the cuff over clothing, using the wrong cuff size, putting the patient in a chair without back support or talking to the patient during measurement. What do we got? Okay, yeah, cuff over clothing, big air, uh, using incorrect cuff size. Seating the patient in a chair without back support, only at 9%, not bad. And talking to the patient during measurement, 18%. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what happens. This table displays the effects of blood pressure results when a patient's not positioned properly. So you can see the changes from cross legs at two to eight millimeters of mercury. And this is systolic blood pressure and um, how it elevates the blood pressure, by the way, these results. Having the cuff too small, uh, up to 10 millimeters of mercury with a full bladder, uh, then talking and unsupportive arm also at 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, but you can see the most impactful is placing the blood pressure cuff over clothing. And that can affect the blood pressure by five to 50 millimeters of mercury. So think about the impact of falsely elevated blood pressure readings. You know, we talk about, uh, we could improperly diagnose a patient or can possibly, you know, again, like I said, over-treat patients and that can lead to falls if we have these blood pressures so high. Next slide, please. So, okay, so we learned from, you know, the poll, like using the incorrect cuff size uh, was kind of tied, um, but it actually, in reality, is the number one error in blood pressure measurement using the incorrect cuff size. So cuffs that are too small can give falsely high blood pressure readings and cuffs that are too large can give falsely low blood pressure readings. As part of the ongoing staff training and competency, staff should be trained to measure the patient's upper arm circumference for selecting the correct cuff size for in-office and patients using SMBP. Staff should use a tape measure to find the midpoint between the acromion process and the olecranon process. So the very top bony part of the shoulder is where you start and the, to the very bottom part of your elbow. Uh, when you wrap the tape measure around the arm at the midpoint for the circumference, uh, that's the measurement you're gonna use. And then when doing in-office blood pressures, there's reference markings on the cuff that you can use to ensure proper size is being used. And uh, for your patients doing SMBP, uh, that can be measured in the office during their training, or they can be taught virtually uh, how to measure their circumference in their arm at home. Uh, next slide, please. So for correct cuff placement, now that you have the correct cuff size, Here's some important things to remember when putting the cuff on. You wanna use upper arm cuffs 
placed over bare skin, which we just talked about, and place the cuff so the center of the cuff is at heart level. You're going to wrap the, round, uh, the cuff around so that one finger can fit under the cuff easily at the top or the bottom, or two fingers would fit snugly. And usually the tubing's align with the brachial artery, but now uh, follow the manufacturer's directions because sometimes an arrow or other, some, some other marking uh, is going to determine where to line up the brachial artery. And next slide, please. And uh, Lakin's going to give you a little bit of a demo on what the markings on the cuff show us. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Linda. Sometimes it's helpful to see an actual cuff. Um, so let's go ahead and talk through some of the features. So this is just a cuff I have here for demonstration purposes. You'll see here we have the index marker. Right over here we have our range. So as long as when you put the cuff on the patient, this index marker falls within that range, you know that that's going to be the right size for the patient. A couple other features that I wanted to note is that let's say um, you are having to use a tape measure to determine the patient's arm circumference. On the cuffs, it'll also say which arm circumference is covered by this particular cuff. So something important for you to be looking at. Additionally, there is the artery marker. So you always wanna be sure that you are placing the cuff or the patient is placing the cuff correctly. So placing that artery marker over their brachial artery. And also just wanted to note that the bladder of the cuff is the inflatable portion of the cuff. So when Linda was talking about the um, ranges and how to determine, you want to be sure that you're looking specifically at the bladder of the cuff. It's not the entire cuff itself. It's the part that inflates. Linda, I'll go ahead and turn it right back over to you. Thanks, Lake. And, you know, I got a couple of, I see a couple of comments in the chat. So people were having trouble um, seeing Lakin. So you want to make sure that up in the right hand corner you have view. Um, you can do a side by side speaker um, or a side by side gallery. Um, and that uh, should help you, hopefully. So, okay. Um, next slide, please. Although I can see actually the, the in my view. Linda, I just updated the setting. So for attendees, it should be side-by-side -side speaker now. So that should hopefully help. Very good. Thanks, Caitlin, for helping us out. All right, I don't know if you can see me yet because I see Caitlin's name. So, all right. So here we are, uh, patient preparation, very important. So you wanna get accurate measurements, rely on how we prepare and get the patients ready for their readings. So you want to educate patients that prior to their appointments, they want to avoid caffeine, exercise, tobacco, um, and other stimulants for 30 minutes before the visit. And then you want to have the patient empty their bladder if they feel that it's full, because we saw that can elevate your blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury. And we know there's a lot of activity in clinics, but try to have the patient rest for three to five minutes in a quiet area prior to measurement. If you can't build in that rest period, then uh, take the blood pressure as the last thing you do when you're getting the patient ready for the provider. Next slide, please. So when you measure patient's blood pressure, you wanna make sure the patient is present, uh, positioned for the accurate measurement. And this includes having them looking like this, seated in a chair with their back supported, their legs uncrossed and their feet flat on the floor. And if their feet aren't flat on the floor, have them place their feet on a step stool. Uh, again, using cuff, you know, appropriately sized for the patient and place it over bare skin. And the patient's arm should be supported on a table or a surface in such a manner that the middle of the cuff is at heart level. Uh, next slide, please. So we know that every exam room is different and that, um, you know, we're just giving you an idea of how you can arrange your exam room for accurate measurement. So. They're usually designed with the panel of devices on the wall that sits behind the exam table, uh, but the device should actually be at eye level of the observer so that moving it over by the chair and by a table with arm support um, would be a more accurate reading location. And chairs, you want them to have an armrest that can be used for arm support as well, but for taller people that kind of need to use the table. And if you can't put a chair by a table or a desk, you can use the end of the exam table um, or there's that footrest that pulls out. It's just like about an inch or two lower 
Uh, and you can use that for arm support as well. Uh, just don't have your patients sit on the exam table for blood pressure measurement uh, because they're not getting any of the support that we're uh, asking for. So these are just a few ideas um, to configure, uh, reconfigure exam rooms if you need them. Next slide, please. Okay, now it's time to talk about performing a couple of measurements. Next slide. So we've talked about how a single measurement doesn't represent a patient's true blood pressure. Guidelines recommend two readings at each clinic visit. So readings should be taken one to two minutes apart. And since most everyone's kind of concerned with time and process flow, the one minute rest period might be preferred and easier to um, incorporate. And then uh, you wanna take those two readings and average them, uh, average the systolic separate from the diastolic. And then that reading should be document documented in the EHR and used for clinical decision-making. Next slide, please. And so the clinic should have a, uh, should they have a blood pressure they consider to be high where they're using, you know, 130 over 80 or 140 over 90 as your target, uh, make sure there's a system in place for notifying the provider of the high blood pressure. So you can notify them verbally. Uh, some EHRs have an alert like highlighting the high reading in red, uh, but you have to make sure the provider, you know, sees it and uh, before they uh, see the patient. And another helpful thing that some sites do is they put a colored card on the desk or the keyboard in the exam room. Doesn't say anything, it's just a trigger and, uh, or use a magnet or a sticker. Uh, we've had sites use like heart-shaped uh, magnets that they stick on the door frame of the, um, the exam room, or you can use a post-it note outside of the exam room, just something to signal that the patient's blood pressure was high. And uh, now I'll pass it over to Lakin. Next slide, please. Wonderful, thanks, Linda. So Linda talked a lot about in-office measurements. So let's now go ahead and talk a bit about self-measured blood pressure. Next slide, please. So just to be clear, when I'm talking about self-measured blood pressure or SMBP, you may hear me refer to it as, what we're talking about is when patients are measuring their blood pressure regularly outside of the clinical setting. And again, that's the patient measuring their own blood pressure, not someone else performing a measurement for them. Next slide. So before we go any further, I wanted to get a sense from you on you know, what your current practices are. So do providers at your organization recommend that patients measure their own blood pressure at home? Go ahead and put a response in the poll and just a yes or no single choice. We'll give you a second to answer that question. Wonderful. So I see that about 90% say yes, that their providers do recommend patients self-measure their blood pressure at home. So that's great. It's a really great start. What we do want to ensure is that when SMBP is being used, that it's being used in an evidence-based fashion so that providers are getting reliable information that they can use for clinical decision-making. And they can use that information to then address treatment and help get patients to goal. So what I want to do now is just outline some of those evidence-based recommendations for all of you now. So next slide, please. All right. So just like with in-office measurements, the device and the cuff that you use are extremely important. So patients should use a validated upper arm device to measure their own blood pressure, and we want to be sure that the cuff is the appropriate size for them. If the cuff is the wrong size, you're not going to get an accurate reading. So most of the home devices come with a standard size cuff. So that usually covers arm circumferences from about eight or nine to eight to 14 inches, but this may not work for all patients. And again, that kind of varies by the device or the manufacturer. So be sure you're looking at what that circumference is. But again, that standard size may not be appropriate for the patients. Some devices do have the option of an extra large cuff. So that may be needed for some of your patients. And in instances where there's not a cuff large enough for a patient, a wrist cuff can be considered um, when there's not an upper arm cuff that's available. The issue with the wrist cuff and why it's usually recommended to stay away from them when possible is because positioning with them and 
keeping true to what the accurate positioning should be is really tough. Um, positioning technique seems to wane over time. And if you're not positioning correctly, you're not going to get accurate readings. So that is why the upper arm devices are the preferred method whenever possible. Next slide, please. So let's go ahead and give you another poll. It's really important that in order to self-measure properly, patients get some training and education. So wanted to hear from you all, who provides that training and education on SMBP to patients? Is it providers? Is it nurses? Is it, is it MAs? Is there someone else? Or is that not something that you routinely do at this time? Go ahead and, and you may have multiple answers here. So pick whatever is most appropriate for you. All right, so I see about 25% is providers, 75% nurses or RNs, other for about 8%, and about 8% do not currently do any education at that time. Thank you guys for the responses. So let's talk about some of the information that patients do need in that training in order to be sure that they know how to properly self-measure. Next slide, please. So first, patients need to know how to properly prepare themselves for the measurement. So they should be told to empty their bladder and rest for five minutes before taking the measurement. While the measurement is actually occurring, they should be sure that they're sitting still and they're quiet without having a conversation or reading or texting. They're really just sitting still, being quiet in that restful state. You will wanna show the patient how to properly use the home device and ensure that they know how to properly put on the appropriate size cuff. Patients should also be told which arm they should be using for the measurements and to determine what their blood pressure arm would be, a measurement should be taken in each arm and the arm with the higher reading would be the arm used going forward. So be sure the patient knows which arm they should be using. Next slide, please. Patients also need to know how to properly position themselves for the measurement. So much like in office, these are going to be some of the same techniques here. So they should be seated with their back supported, their legs should be uncrossed, their feet should be flat on the floor. They should be in a place, they should be able to place that appropriately sized cuff on their bare upper arm. If they are rolling up their sleeve, just something to keep in mind, sometimes it can become really tight and actually cause like a tourniquet effect. So we just want to be sure that that is not happening um, because that will, of course, impact the blood pressure reading. Patients should be sure to rest their arm so that the middle of the cuff can be at heart level and they're not having to use any muscles to keep their arm in that position because that would, again, have an impact on their blood pressure. So we want to be sure that that arm is really resting and the palm should be facing up. In order to get accurate readings, there is a protocol um, that is outlined in the guidelines that Linda referred to earlier. And the recommendation is to have patients take two blood pressure readings in the morning and two blood pressure readings in the evening. And there should be a one minute rest period between those two measurements that are being taken. And this protocol should be followed for a week. So that would result in 28 readings. So of course that would be optimal, but um, we recognize that may not always be feasible for all individuals. So a minimum of three days or 12 readings is what's needed over the course of those seven days in order to use those readings for clinical decision-making. And another really important part is that you make a plan with the patient of when and how they're going to get those readings back to you. Because of course, if you're not getting the readings back, there's not going to be, you're not going to be able to take action based on that information. Next slide, please. So when a patient completes their week of home measurements, they would relay that back to their care team. And as long as they've provided that minimum of three days or 12 readings, the care team should average all of the readings received into a single systolic and a single diastolic value. And this average should be shared with the provider so that they could use it for interpretation and for clinical decision-making to see if any adjustments need to be made to the patient's treatment plan. Once that plan's made, the patient should be notified and made aware of any changes that they may need to make so that they can do their part to help get themselves to goal. 
One thing I did want to note is that there are some CPT codes that have been developed so that teams can submit for reimbursement for the time and resources that it takes for patient training and interpretation and monitoring of these SMBP results. So there's a resource on our Target BP website where you can learn more about these codes. So I'm going to turn it over to Linda now for a quick demonstration on the SMBP device. Thanks, Lincoln. So hopefully, um, can you guys see me? Because I see Lincoln still for some reason. So okay. I can see you, Linda. Okay, great. Okay, so I have a, a few devices I'm going to show you. These first two, um, what's bad is I can't see what I'm doing. So uh, these first two just have a single, thank you, have a single button to push to get it started. And these two, uh, all and all the devices that I'm showing you, that I'm going to show you three, are validated on our uh, listing. And uh, this one in particular, though, this is a, a Welch Allen. This one has a little more of a pin push um, connection. And this one has the availability of an extra large cuff, which is why they have this uh, different type of uh, connection for their cords, their tubing. Um, and again, this one, though, is also special because the Welch Allen actually inflates. While it inflates, it's taking the blood pressure measurement, so it takes the blood pressure reading a little faster than the other devices. Okay, and then this one, this is different. Um, this one has the ability to take readings for two people. So um, if patient has a spouse or somebody, you know, we don't recommend that they share the devices during the measurement period, but other times they can keep their readings separate by, by using this. And this device also has the ability to show memory of readings um, and uh, not all devices have that. So you can see memory here. And uh, so the provider, they could take those readings to the provider and they can scroll through and see what the results were uh, right off the device. And that's it. Wonderful. Thanks, Linda. Next slide, please. All right. So now I wanted to show you some of the tools and resources that are available on the Target BP website relating to blood pressure measurement, both in the office and self-measured. Next slide, please. So we have the very popular positioning infographic, which you'll see on the right here. And care teams usually hang this in areas where blood pressure is measured. It is a really great reminder on how to properly position the patients. And we've also found that it's a way to get patients engaged in the process as well. They take a look at it. They may start to ask questions or be sure, reposition themselves to be sure that they're in the right spot. So it's been a great um, care team and patient engagement tool. On the left, the technique quick check is a great way to ensure that blood pressures are being measured correctly in your sites. So after teams are trained on accurate measurement, you can use this tool to conduct blood pressure observations and determine if there's any areas where improvements may be needed. Next slide, please. So the Measure Accurately Quick Start Guide outlines activities that your team can do to help make improvements in the accuracy of your blood pressure measurements. And as you may know, one of the first steps to improving is to understand your current state so that you can determine where your opportunities lie. And the Measure Accurately pre-assessment, which you'll see on the right, is a great way for you to determine your current state. Next slide, please. So after care teams are trained on accurate measurement, you can consider conducting competencies to ensure that the training was understood. And Linda spoke to these a bit earlier. The Target BP website has these competency forms you see on the screen available for both manual and automated blood pressure devices. Um, so staff should be trained every six to 12 months to keep their skills. And if this isn't a part of your current practice, you can consider incorporating it into existing annual trainings, or if you have existing staff competencies, something you might want to consider adding as well. Next slide, please. All right, so we have a great tool available to help care teams average multiple readings, whether those be in office or the self-measured blood pressure readings we're getting back from patients. And Linda's going to show us how this tool works. So I'll turn it over to you, Linda. Great, I'm gonna take over your screen. 
And here you see the website. So because we want all of those blood pressure readings to be averaged um, for the SMBP, or you know, even if you have to use it in, in the office, um, you can take this site, you just put your cursor into the systolic and the diastolic and um, move it and enter your readings. And then if you need to add more, just click the add BP reading plus sign at the bottom and then you just enter all your readings and then you hit calculate and that'll give you your average. And this is what you should be documenting in your EHR. Wonderful, thank you, Linda. Next slide, please. All right, so I previously shared the quick start guide for Measure Accurately. We also have one available for SMBP. So again, this is a great tool and it lays out some steps your team can take if you're looking to implement a new SMBP protocol or revise an existing one that you have. We also have a quick presentation that you'll see on the right that highlights some of the important aspects of SMBP for care teams that are looking to implement it. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, training patients to properly self-measure is very important so that they know what to do and we can really trust those readings that we're getting back from them so they can be used for clinical decision-making. So on the right, you'll see the patient training checklist. And this is a tool that care teams can use to ensure that the information the patients need to properly self-measure is relayed to them during the training. And also in order, like I said, to make those clinical decisions, we need to be sure that we're getting those readings back from the patient so that we can act on them. So on the left, you'll see a seven day log. This is a paper log that patients can use to track their SMBP readings using the protocol that I discussed earlier. And remember an important part of the whole training process would be getting a plan in place with the patient on when and how they're gonna be getting these readings back to you so that they can be for clinical decision making. Next slide, please. Here you will see two tools that can be used to help patients understand what they need to do to self-measure. So the infographic on the left outlines how they can properly prepare, position, and self-measure. It's a great tool that can be used during training and also sent home with the patient so they can refer to it as needed as they're doing self-measurement. And then we also have an SMBP video that patients can watch. Um, and it looks like we have some time to do that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that video now. Self-measured blood pressure monitoring is important and needs to be done correctly so it can be used to help improve your health. Let's review the basics. Self-measured blood pressure monitoring is when you measure your blood pressure while not at your doctor's office or another healthcare setting. Self-monitoring will help your care team gain a more complete picture of your blood pressure over time. This is most commonly done in home. The American Heart Association and American Medical Association recommend using an automated, validated device with an upper arm cuff, and preferably one with memory that stores at least 30 blood pressure readings. If you're unsure, ask your doctor or pharmacist for advice. Typically, you can measure your blood pressure with just a push of a button. Make sure the cuff you're using is the right size and fits properly. If you are not sure, ask your care team. Many factors affect blood pressure results, so it is critical you follow the instructions your care team provides on how to properly self-measure. Watch this video closely. If you have any questions, ask your care team for help before getting started. Let's review step-by-step step how to properly self-measure your blood pressure. First, be prepared. You will be taking your blood pressure twice each morning and twice each evening. If you take blood pressure medication, measure your blood pressure before you take your medication. Prior to measuring your blood pressure, make sure you empty your bladder, and avoid exercise, caffeine, and tobacco for at least 30 minutes before getting started. Find a quiet space without distractions. Second, get in the right position. Sit with your back supported and do not cross your legs or ankles. Have your feet flat on the floor. 
If your feet don't reach, place them on a stool or other object so they are supported. Rest the arm you will use to measure your blood pressure on a firm, flat surface at roughly the level of your heart, which is about mid-chest. Have the palm of the hand of that arm face up to relax all of the muscles in the arm. Place the blood pressure cuff on your bare upper arm so that the bottom of the cuff is just above the elbow. Once you are positioned properly, rest quietly for five minutes before taking the first measurement. Third, while measuring your blood pressure, do your best to make sure the room stays quiet and avoid talking with anyone, watching or listening to TV, and using the phone or other electronics. Perform your first measurement. When completed, write down your blood pressure numbers and your pulse that are displayed on your device. Wait one minute, then repeat for your second blood pressure measurement. Write down your second blood pressure numbers and your pulse. Your care team may give you a form to use to write down all of your blood pressure measurements and pulse. Continue your self-measured blood pressure monitoring routine according to the instructions given to you by your care team. Report your blood pressure results to your doctor's office in a timely fashion, and be prepared to discuss results and take action, if needed, based on the information you provide. Self-measured blood pressure monitoring is a great way for your health care to get a more complete picture of your blood pressure. For confirming a diagnosis, assessing blood pressure control after changes in treatment, and monitoring blood pressure control over long periods of time. Remember, you play an important role in ensuring the results your physician or healthcare team receives are accurate. With accurate information, your care team can come up with the best treatment plan for you to improve control of your blood pressure. All right, thank you. Hopefully everyone found that video helpful and you see how it may be helpful as you're working with your patients to implement SMBP. So I think we have one more poll question before we open it up for, for questions. So if we can go to the next slide and launch that poll. So you heard a lot of information today. What are some next steps that you'll do to improve blood pressure measurement accuracy in your practices? So things like evaluating exam rooms to allow for proper positioning, implementing staff training, looking at calibration process, starting an SMBP or revising a current process, sharing information with others at your organization, using some of the resources we highlight, or not sure yet. You can go ahead and pick a few results or a few options if you are thinking of doing more than one. And I'll give you a few seconds to go ahead and answer that poll. All right, so it looks like we have everyone do, or we have people doing a little bit of everything. So we have people that are going to look at their exam rooms and do some training, some that are going to take a look at their calibration process, some that are going to either start a new or revise a current SMBP process, share some of this information or try out some of the resources. And a few that, you know, take it's may, um, that was a lot of information. So probably some time to digest and see where some opportunities lie. So thank you all for, for responding to that. Next slide, please. All right. So I think now we can go ahead and open up for any questions. One of the questions we received in the chat was um, around what the guidelines are for patients to check the accuracy of their SMBP devices. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So that's an important thing. So even when we are using validated devices, which is, again, a recommendation we want to be sure, regardless of in-office or out-of-office devices, that validated devices are being used, it's still important important with SMBP devices that we are actually testing the accuracy of the device in the patient. Um, so the Target BP website actually has a tool that you can use, a device accuracy test tool that can be used to help you take a look at um, if the 
device is able to read appropriately in that particular patient. So what you would do, and again, the tool lay the, lays this out very nicely, but at a high level, what you would do is you would take some measurements with your current measurement device process. So whatever you're using in the office setting and compare it to the out of office. So have the patient bring their device or um, if you're giving them a device have them take some readings with that device. And you would look at the readings that you're getting with each of those two methods and you would do a comparison. Again, that tool walks you through it very nicely. So I would recommend go ahead, going ahead and taking a look at that. Thank you. And Lakin, while we're speaking about SMBP devices, um, or in office, what should someone do if they're cut, they have cup sizes that do not fit the patients with large arms? I'm sorry, Kate. Oh, I'm sorry, Caitlin. Could you repeat that once more? Yes. They, sorry. Um, if if an office or if the patient's SMBP device has cups that do not fit the patients with large arms, what can be done in that situation? Absolutely. Thank you. So let's first talk about in office. Um, so I would recommend if your current devices don't fit some of your patients, take a look and see if there's other cuff sizes available for that particular device. So a lot of devices have cuffs that range from small adult to large adults or thigh. So there are a range of device of cuff sizes available. So take a look at that. Um, some sites have also found that even with those options available, there's not a cuff that works for a particular patient. So they have used a wrist cuff or had one or two wrist cuffs available that they could use in office just for those rare occurrences that a patient can't fit into the cuffs that they have available. Um, again, you would not want to have that be your normal practice because it is hard to maintain positioning. We want to be sure we're getting the most accurate reading things. Um, and also the motor on those devices is not meant to be used for every single patient and the amount of readings that are taken during the day in an office setting. So only use those in the rare instances, but the first step would be taking a look at devices and seeing if there's some more cuffs available for that particular device. For SMBP devices, it, again, it's really important that the patient has a cuff size that works for them. So if they already have a cuff um, and it's not the appropriate size for them, unfortunately, we're not going to get accurate readings with that. So they may need to consider looking into another device if there's um, some loaner devices or if you're able, if they're able to go out and purchase a new one. Um, they may need one with an extra large cuff or if they're if there's not one available that they're able to get, they can consider the use of a wrist cuff, but really be sure that they are sticking true to the positioning technique because that's so important for us to get accurate readings. Thank you. And then we just got another question in the chat. Um, do SMBP devices need to be calibrated? And if so, how often? I'm I'm happy to take that one. Sorry, Linda, I don't want to hog all the questions, but I'll take that one. That's SMBP, <laughs> that was your section. We'll yeah, go there. I'll take it. Um, so SMB, what we talked about a little bit earlier, the device accuracy, that's actually along the lines of the calibration. So you are testing in that patient, is this device able to be used for this patient? Um, so there are some recommendations that are laid out, but just recognizing the feasibility of not per, possibly not being able to calibrate every single device in every patient on an annual basis, you may want to look at what's feasible for your site. So when you're doing the testing, do you want to do calibration when the patient gets a new device? And then again, you know, maybe if you're seeing the readings may be very off from what you're seeing in the office setting, if you're kind of concerned that it may not be reading accurately, that may be some of the time that you want to do calibration if you're not able to do it on an annual basis or when the patient starts using a new device. Thank you, Lakin. Um, I believe that that is all of the questions that we have received thus far in the chat, and I will hand it over to Mackenzie. I do think that we are about a minute left into our session. So I will pass it back to her. 
Thank you so much to our panelists, Lakin and Linda and Caitlin, and to all of our attendees today for a great discussion. So the next breakout session starts at 10 a.m. You should already have a link for your next session. If not, you can head back to the main room for help. Otherwise, take a moment to get up and stretch, then head to your next breakout session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.